It's June 2020, and from a community conversation about mentoring, we turned our attention to what we can learn from the COVID situations. So five of us got together and had a conversation about what we're learning as we move through the COVID situation in our communities. And with that introduction, enjoy the video and make sure that you comment and share and like the video. And please, if you're on YouTube, hit the bell so that you get notification of more videos coming your way. With that, take care. The thing that is concerning to me about, you know, the effect that COVID's had on people is that now, like, even after people get tested and find out they're negative, it's kind of like our default is to be at a greater distance from each other. It's like we've all, it's like we've interjected stranger danger into all aspects of our society. And I think stranger danger is dangerous anyways. Um, for all of us, not just that so many parents have installed stranger danger in their children. Um, but yeah, I, that's what I've observed. Like for, for example, I just got tested on Friday and I got my test results back and I ran into some friends and I, you know, I told them like I'm negative and I'm really careful and everything. And yet there's still this physical distancing going on. And then even the fact that everyone calls it, or so many people are calling it social distancing, which is completely wrong, right? Obviously right now we're, we're not social distancing, we're physical distancing, right? Viruses are not transmitted via conversation, which is what socializing is. So I wonder how that is affecting all aspects of our world, which include mentoring. You know, it's mentoring now, everything is becoming so dependent on sound, right? Well, well let's, ex let's explore. Let's explore, Brenda. Let, let's see if anyone has anything they'd like to share. I, I think what we're doing is they're connecting this notion of COVID with mentoring, this notion of physical social distancing. Let's see where this might take us. So any other thoughts you have? I can offer some cultural perspective on that being based in Panama in Latin America everyone like hugs kisses to hello and everything and we're in this like really awkward like we have to have a conversation about it every time you see someone <laughs> because like the cultural guidance here has been like bump elbows because you need to have like some sort of action because it's so rude like you you feel out of sorts to not be in someone's presence um, and so there is just this level of, and I think this comes into mentorship of like, we need to just open space for that conversation of, of acknowledging it or what feels comfortable because we're not in a settled state of a new norm. Um, and so just opening up that space to acknowledge that it's weird, I think is probably the first step. Yeah. I tried the other day to try and figure out, I was chatting with someone, I was going, um, uh, uh, trying to, you know, and I just went like this. <laughs> and that person went like this and we said, okay, that's taken care of and off we go. So sort of in our own mini way, we were at least acknowledging what was going on. So, uh, so one of the things that I found is that from a relationship perspective, I think that having going, going through this, the whole pandemic and that has brought the aspect of the need for a relationship it's heightened that awareness so that when you do have a, a mentoring session, a mentoring interaction, whether it's in person or whether it's virtual, is that there's there's the underlying need that I need to I need to to be able to embrace the con the concept of of uh, a two way trusted relationship more than at any other time. Um, in, in the world or in time for that matter. And to that point, Doug, some people are doing that better than others. And I, I've really seen that. And I, obviously we've, we know as mentors, some people have built their skills of an emotional intelligence more, communication more. Some people have functioned in an online environment more than others. 
Um, so we're seeing different levels of comfort. And I can see that with my friend group. We, there's some people that have just kind of like completely disappeared and pulled away. And then as soon as there's an opportunity to be physically present to each other, boom, they're back like normal versus people that are good at communicating online. You can see that in work relationships, dating relationships, friendships, and that comes into mentorship as well is some people are more versed on this. So I think that there is some level of needing to give space for people to still learn that. And it can be very uncomfortable when people are at a different level of understanding on that skill. And what I've also seen is I, I work with uh, a leadership team at a private school and we've been now we've been doing all the mentoring sessions. So I meet with each one of them once a month and it's been ongoing, consistent and all of that. But we've now we're now doing them virtually. So I have an hour to an hour and a half with each person. And what I had offered was the opportunity to uh, meet face to face at the end of the school year, at the end of June. And for the most part, I would say 80% said, oh, we're okay with the virtual stuff. We actually prefer that to meeting face to face because there is something different that we get from the, the conversation that we get to have with you that we didn't feel we were getting when we were doing the face to face stuff. So it, 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 and I think part of that can be attributed to the fact that we're now having to do virtual more and more often as a means to be able to have those uh, conversations that people are just starting to get used to that, that method of communication. And, and I think as we as mentors, as long as we make sure that we're still bringing the value, then that method can still be, still be a way for us to move forward. So that, that can actually be one of those epiphanies or learning uh, opportunities that, that came from the, the conversation around COVID and, and mentoring. You notice, Doug, if your style has needed to change in terms of people being burnt out from having so many Zoom meetings and things like that, um, because the, the attention span is shorter. And I guess context for that question is we did a session with my work with a psychologist about um, online connection and growth opportunities. And she very eloquently basically said, because there is just a microsecond lapse of time in the video to the voice that's happening. And our brains are naturally designed to pick up on those, the physical movements and body movements that go with communication. We get taxed and exhausted because our brain's having to calculate that microsecond. Um, and so I don't know if you've noticed like in shortening sessions or lengthening sessions or how that interaction is taking place, but if you've seen any differences in how people are engaging with you for different lengths of time. Uh so if I use that group as an example, and, and I typically, I have with, there's what, eight of them. So six of them, we keep it to an hour. Two of them are an hour and a half. And I know, I know without fail, I may as well plan on an hour and a half because if I schedule an hour, we're going to go over. And but what, I'm, what I'm also seeing is that and this is where I think our, intuition, our ability to read the body language virtually and all of those things really plays into it. I can tell when enough is enough, that we've, we've talked long enough and it's time to sort of figure out a way to graciously exit the conversation. And, and if there's any takeaways that either one of us have to, you know, to, to own that we talk about those, but, you know, I'm getting a sense that, you know, we've probably exhausted everything that we could talk about today do you have anything else you want to talk about and if not would you you know shall we end the call today and if something else comes up please feel free to reach out to me in the end term and that's actually something that i've seen uh an uptake on is the in between the formal scheduled sessions i'm getting more i just need to chat i need i have something or you know I actually have one of the, one of the individuals that um, can't talk to her significant other and the, the, the children at home are saying, can you talk about something else other than work? Right? Yeah. I think the, the whole role of telephone 
um, is an interesting intermediary or media in this conversation. So, so I think Doug, you used the word different. Yes, it's different. And yet, um, telephone, telephone conference calls, etc., have been around like, I don't even know how long, probably 20 years. And having managed a market northern BC in the Yukon for a number of years, my direct team were spread all over. And so we actually went through learning at that time about how to effectively engage and facilitate those types of environments. So what has been interesting is exit sort of conference call, re-entry on Zoom video. Mm -hmm. And so why, why, why the society just left to Zoom versus here we have a multiple of choices, let's choose the one that fits best for the culture of the organization and, and the people and all the rest of that. People have jumped right to Zoom as being the, the media of choice, which is sort of interesting because if I'm on a conference call, most of the time I'm walking and I'm kind of walking, might be in a four foot circle, but I'm up and I'm around and I'm moving and I find that my ability to stay focused on the conversation is better because I can move a little, or like I feel like I can move a little bit. And because I'm very focused on the voice and, and being intently focused on the nuances of tone and cadence and those kinds of things. So even the jump from mentoring or engagement with others from, we, we used to have meetings or face to face, now we felt it necessary for whatever reason to jump to Zoom is that I actually have used that intermediary a lot more than I had historically. So telephone and conference call, just a non, non-video conference call because of a lot of those other factors as well. I'll, I'll just pick up on that a little bit and sort of blend a little bit here. One of the things that I've noticed, and I just did it, is that I'll look away. Like, I, I want to make a point, and I'll look away. It's because I'm a visual person, and I go up into my screen in my head to, to make a point. And sometimes it looks kind of odd at, 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 for some people because I'm, when you're in a room, you tend to look at the person and I'll tend to look off now a lot more than I used to. So sometimes I have to explain to the person, no, I'm just gone off to look in my notebook in my head or to go look at something so I can bring it back into the conversation. And I've sort of taken it on a bit as a, a natural behavior for me now. And I've noticed that. Question. This is super interesting though. Are you feeling pressure or have you got comments from somebody else on that or are you thinking that you need to look and be engaged in a certain way on camera that you're oh. feeling like it's weird? Both. Interesting. Yeah. So I've had a person, where, where are you going? Aren't you here? And it's like, <laughs> are you going off daydreaming or something? And I have to, no, no, because I'm a visual learner, when I'm sitting at a desk and we're in a group of people, I usually have a pad okay, blank paper, pencil, pen, and I'll write a note, right, to try and remember where I'm going because this is my visual way. But here I tend to look off, right, and, and do it that way. So I've noticed me doing it more. Is that, I'm not going to say it's uh, something I need to check on because it's just naturally me. And that's great, okay, but I just thought I would – add that in because I've done everything from uh, I was one of the first ones to do online education right and actually delivered online I was also one of the one of the sort of latter people who did the conference call where you sit right in a little booth and share <laughs> right and I've done all the different kind of medias where you know you're watching the television you got people in your classroom and you're, you're doing all the, trying to juggle all the different medias and everything like that. So 
I've just found it fascinating about how I'm interacting, right? Because now my eyes are popping and my head's going up and down as I look at the different people in the different images, where normally if you're in a conference room, you're sort of scanning at a similar level, right? So a little cues to what you're talking about, Desiree, is I, I'm picking up and I go, oh yeah, hang on a minute. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. So thank you. And I'm blending that with what Yvonne and, and Doug has just shared. So, but can I circle around, Brenda, you started this off a little bit. What, what are you picking up now that might be of interest to all of us? Well, I think it's interesting that uh, the different perspectives on this call, and it really brings me back to how each of us as individuals bring our preconceived notions and assumptions about what is our normal to whatever the current situation is. So for me, I've been doing video conferencing since the mid 90s. Uh, so none of this is strange to me. Uh, it's, this is normal. And so what I've noticed about others on a, on a Zoom or any of the video calls uh, where there's collaboration is I find the communication is kind of more polite because you have to wait for the other person to stop talking. It's not as easy to just talk over top of other people as it is when you're all sitting in the room and the loudest person wins, right? So I really like that. And I find the people, you know, if you remember last year, uh, there's and, and beyond before that, there's all these people that thought that technology and specifically social media was some side, some kind of divider between authentic, you know, connection of people, which I never agreed with. I mean, I've been on the internet since '85 when people didn't know it existed, and and my early in '85, it was all about socializing with people around the world at different universities that were on there as well. So for me, it's always been a way to have distance communication, whereas other people, so it, it all is about what, what is it you bring? I mean, I look around all the time because I treat it the same as any other meeting. And when I'm in a boardroom leading a meeting, um, I don't stare at whoever's talking the whole time. Like that's uncomfortable, <laughs> you know? So that's the way I, so to me, it's just interesting, different perspectives, right? Uh, yeah, and I think that that brings to the mentoring conversation as well. So, and, and I think what really, if we bring it full circle, it's really about understanding who is, who is the person that we're communicating with and understanding what their expectations are so that we can start within their expectations because it's not about what I say, it's about what you hear, right? And so I need to start within that expectation and then hopefully broaden within a mentoring context, broaden that expectation to realize, well, there's more than what they brought to the conversation, helping them broaden their horizons within whatever the subject is of mentoring, but also within the context of doing video meetings. Yeah, and Brenda, just to your point about, you used the term polite, I'll use the word formal, but even the, the whole, um, formal recapping at the end of a meeting like a lot of times people would recap at the end of a meeting but maybe it's also whiteboarded the the next three things that need to be done or those types of things and now it's like there's this as we discussed and you kind of go through this because because you only have th that specific media that that is related to being able to see p see each other and even something as simple as the the notebook so mine's a little sticky note in my pen but you know when when you're in a room with a mentee and you know you're making notes and they can see that you've written down their personal commitment to you or to each other and there's there's something cognitive that goes with that that says oh i i'm gonna follow up on that because i know she wrote it down Whereas now it's like the, um, the replay of that is necessary in order to be able to achieve that same personal accountability to self, right? We did a fun exercise at work where we all backed up our camera so that we showed our full environment around us. <laughs> and, and that, to your point, that might help with that kind of scenario is not just having your face in the camera, but like 
actually showing your space and showing that you're writing and just creating a more organic environment instead of this little like box that we kind of curate. Um, and that level of like vulnerability into your space can maybe make that a bit more natural if it's, if it's a challenge too. You know, the other thing is with Zoom meetings, most Zoom meetings are being recorded. So it makes me curious about how meetings uh, might play out differently in terms of different types of discrimination that typically happen, right? Going back to the speaking over top of someone that you perceive is at a lower status, whether that's conscious or unconscious. Uh, I, I, it, it just makes me curious about how that might lead to more listening, which I think is, is good, you know, because we have so much talking in our world, like Twitter, I, I like to joke that Twitter is everyone's talking and no one's listening, right? <laughs> um, so, but listening is a really important skill, uh, specifically as, as a mentor, especially. Well, I was watching a video this morning and the person had panned quite out into their office and I got drawn to something in the, as I'm looking at the bottom left, and it was a towel thrown on the floor amongst a, a bunch of paper that looked like it exploded. Mm -hmm. All right. And I, I got clicked over to it and I went, what am I doing? She's over here. So I came back up and paid attention, but I got, what's a blue towel doing on top of a bunch of paper that looked like it exploded? So I'm not listening to her giving really great insights, but I got caught with a blue towel. So I hear what you're saying, right? I happened to me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep your office neat. Is <laughs> <laughs> It's like just before I started, I moved my bag of chips down. <laughs> right. Well, luckily you can't see all the boxes. Rating. I got my printer out of the box. Yeah. So. <laughs> and it's good. almost breakfast time out, out uh, in your time zone. So that's chips for breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, you got to pay attention. You got to... no judgment here. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's okay. Once we're done, I will have a few, so it's okay. <laughs> Thanks for watching the video. We have an ask of you. Make sure you click the subscribe button and click the bell beside subscribe, so you can receive more notifications of the videos that we're loading up, and like the video, and especially. If you could comment your insights, we would uh, enjoy learning from you. Take care.